This lesson is going to focus on basic properties of integration and we're going to go through evaluating different integrals and then we're going to go through a more complicated um, problem set at the end of the video. So we'll start by going through kind of the four most important properties um, or integrals that you need to know. The first is the, the power rule of integration. Uh, we use this one pretty much every day for the last few months. Um, so the basic idea is if you integrate a polynomial function uh, where x is raised to some number n, the value of that integral is x raised to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c. Uh, so integral of x squared is x cubed over 3 plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. Second property is the value of the integral of sine that is equal to negative cosine of x plus c, whereas the derivative is positive cosine. Number three is the integral of cosine. Well, that is going to be positive, positive sine of x plus c. Okay, and then the last one here which we'll see a little bit of at the end of this video is let's say I define g of x as a function where x is a variable in the integral or in the limits of integration. If I take the derivative of this, if I take the derivative of this, the derivative of the left hand side can be written as uh, g prime whereas the derivative of the right hand side because of the second fundamental theorem of calculus, the x replaces the t inside the integral, and this is equal to f of t. Um, and this right here is a direct result, a direct result of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, we say part two, because remember there's two parts, and this is the second part. So I think these are the most important properties um, that we're going to see in this video today. So we're going to start by going through just some basic integrals, um, being able to evaluate these following integrals. And especially for questions like this, I would strongly encourage you to try these beforehand and just check your answers um, after I go through them. All right, so number one, if I have this integral here, I can define it as 4x to the negative 2 dx. And we want to write it like this because uh, it makes using the power of integration a little bit easier. Um, so if I write this function as 4x to the negative 2, I can factor the 4 out and the integral of x to the negative 2 is negative x to the negative 1. And we're evaluating this from 1 to 2. Okay, another way to write negative x to the negative 1 is negative 1 over x evaluated from 1 to 2. Okay, I'm going to plug in the upper bound and then subtract what I get when I plug in the lower bound. And this is a product of the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So we end up with negative 1 half. Well, we're going to be subtracting a negative, so it's plus 1 over 1. Okay, so negative 1 half plus 1 is going to be positive 1 half times 4 is 2. Okay, and that's the answer for this one. All right, next one. The integral from 1 to 4 of dt over t times root t. Let's just rewrite this first. Um, well, instead of writing t root t, I can write it like this. t times t to the 1 half. Well, it's going to be equal to 1 integral from 1 to 4 of dt over, now if I multiply these two terms together, I can add their exponents. And so I'm left with t to the 3 over 2 in the denominator. This becomes the same thing as t to the negative 3 over 2 dt. Okay, and now we're in a position where we can integrate this function. So the integral of this will be, um, I'm, I'll actually write it down here. We're going to add 1 to negative 3 over 2. 
Okay, if I add one to negative three over two, I'm left with t to the negative one half divided by negative one half. And we're gonna evaluate this from one to four. Dividing by negative one half is the same thing as multiplying by two. So we can rewrite this expression inside as negative two t to the positive one half. Now we're gonna plug in four and then subtract what we get when we plug in the number one. So if I plug in four, negative two over uh, the square root of four, minus negative, so plus two over the square root of one. Okay, negative two over root four is just gonna be negative one. Plus two over root one is plus two. So the answer for this part, our number two here is the number one. Okay, all right, let's wrap up this, uh, this problem set here by evaluating this last integral. The integral of one over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. So we end up with the natural log of the absolute value of x evaluated from one to e. Let's plug in the upper bound and then subtract what we get when we plug in the lower bound. The natural log of e, well that's just the number one, minus the natural log of one, which is zero. So this last integral is also equal to just the number one. Okay, so notice because of these are all definite integrals, uh, meaning they have limits of integration, uh, the answers for these are going to be uh, numbers. Whereas if the limits of integration were not there, the, answer would, the answers would be functions. Okay, and that's what we're going to see in the next problem set. So problem set number two. Let's evaluate the following integrals here. Because we're dealing with the composition of two functions, uh, we want to do a u substitution for each one of these integrals below. So let's start with the first one. So we have the integral, the integral of 200 x times 2x squared minus 5 to the 99th power dx. Okay, the u value for this is going to be 2x squared minus 5. And then we're going to take the derivative of this on both sides. So du is equal to 4x dx. Well, we don't have a 4x dx over here. We just have an x dx. So let's divide this by 4 on both sides. And now we're in a position where we can do our substitution. We can bring the 200 to the outside of this integral. Uh, let's replace 2x squared with just u. So it's u raised to the 99th power. And then this x dx that I underlined, that's equivalent to 1 4th du. Let's factor the 1 4th to the outside. And so we have 50 the integral of u to the 99th du. Now let's integrate this using the power rule of integration. So 50 times u to the 99th plus one is 100, u to the 100th over 100 plus c. And now we end up with u to the 100th divided by two. Okay, we're almost done. Now we're just gonna replace the value that we assigned u to be in for u here, leaving us with our final answer. So here's our answer for number one. 2x squared minus 5 to the 100th power divided by 2 plus c. And let's leave our answer like that. All right, next one. Number two. I'll draw it over here. The integral of e to the x, e to the x plus two cubed, okay? This is also gonna be u substitution because if we assign this to be our u value, uh, remember we want the derivative of some part of the integrand to be equal to another part of the integrand. Now this underlined part, e to the x plus two, the derivative of that is e to the x, which is located somewhere else inside the integrand. 
Uh, and so for that reason, that's a really good indication that use substitution is going to be the method that we want to use to approach this problem. So I'm going to assign u to be e to the x plus 2, uh, which means du is equal to e to the x dx. And now let's do our substitution. 1 over u cubed times, well, the e to the x in the numerator dx, that just equals du. Okay. Now we can rewrite 1 over u cubed as u to the negative 3. Uh, and now let's integrate this. So we're going to add 1 and divide by what we get. And so we end up with uh, negative 1 over 2 u squared plus c. And we're just going to replace u with e to the x plus 2 squared plus c. Okay, then lastly, this one also is also going to be u sub because the value of, I'll just draw it over here, the value of the derivative of part of this integrand is equal to another part of the integrand. So if I assign u to be e to the x plus 1, the du value is e to the x dx, which is located somewhere else in the integrand. So we end up with du over u. Well, we know from previous problem set that the, the value of the integral of du over u is equal to the natural log of du, sorry, the natural log of u plus c. And then the last thing we're going to do here is plug in what we assigned u to be at the start of this problem. So here's our answer for this one, sorry, it's uh, x e to the x plus 1 for number 3. So here are the three integrals. So it's important to know how to evaluate integrals using uh, evaluate definite integrals, indefinite integrals. Remember that indefinite integrals have a plus c at the end. Uh, definite integrals, your answer is going to be a number that does not have that plus c. The c's will cancel out when you go through the integration. All right, let's uh, wrap up this video by going through uh, one more problem set, problem set three, which is going to be a little bit more challenging, a little bit more conceptual. Okay, so we have a graph here that is the graph of f, and we know that g of x is defined as the integral from 2 to x of f of t. So, um, we're asked a series of questions about g. For example, for a letter A, does g have a relative minimum, a relative maximum, or neither at x equals 10? All right, the first thing we want to do here is recognize that to find a relative maximum, relative minimum of a function, we need to determine whether or not the sign of the derivative is changing at those points. For a relative minimum, the derivative will go from a negative value to a positive value. Because for there to be a relative minimum, the original function has to go from decreasing to increasing. So we want minimum or negative value to a positive value for the derivative. I'll say 4g prime. For relative maximum, we want a positive value to a negative value g prime. Okay, well the question is how do we get g prime? We're given the graph of f and we know that g of x is defined as the value of the integral of f. And so what we're going to do here for letter a is we're going to take this integral and I'm going to take the derivative of this integral on both sides. The derivative of the left hand side <clears throat> is equal to g prime and then the derivative of the right hand side, this is the fourth rule that we talked about at the beginning of the video, is equal to f of x. At x equals 10, g prime equals f, so you can say either g prime or f, goes from negative to negative. So notice it's negative here, 
and then it stays negative. So the value of the derivative of g, which is equal to the value of f, goes from a negative value to the left of x equals 10, and then it stays negative to the right of x equals 10. So because of this, so there is neither a relative max nor a relative min. at that point. All right, we use the term saddle point or plateau in class. Does the graph G have a point of inflection at x equals four? Well, we know from letter A that G prime of x is equal to f of x. If we wanna talk about the point of inflection of G, we need to find the second derivative of G. So what I'm gonna do here is take the derivative of this equation. And so the value of the second derivative of g is equal to the value of f, or the derivative of f. So g, and we're talking about 4 here. So the question is, does g have a point of inflection here at 4? Uh, we're going to say that g has a point of inflection. at x equals 4 because g prime is equal to f goes from increasing to decreasing. So notice on the graph, this is the graph of f. This graph goes from increasing to decreasing at that point, which means that g double prime is equal to f prime is changing signs. More specifically, it's going from a positive value to a negative value because the slope of the uh, derivative is going from positive to negative. If the second derivative changes sign. So if g double prime is changing sign, that is an indication that there's a point of inflection. So there is a point of inflection here at x equals 4 for letter b. Okay, and we're going to wrap up this video by going through um, this last question, which wants us to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum on the interval negative 4 to 12. Whenever you're asked to find the absolute max or min on a given interval, the first thing you want to do is determine the value of that function at the endpoints of your given interval. Interval. So what I would do here is make a table where this is x and we're going to call this g of x. We want the, uh, the absolute maximum from and minimum from negative 4 to 12. Okay. And to do that, we're going to be using the graph and a little bit of geometry. Um, so we have the endpoints, but we also need the relative maxim, maximums and relative minimums. Well, the relative maximum is going to be where f, the derivative of g, goes from negative to positive. That's right here. So we're going to put that in our table. And where the value of the graph of g, the derivative of f, goes from positive to negative. And so let's plug these values in here. So negative two, that's our potential absolute minimum. And then uh, positive six, that's our potential absolute maximum. Okay, so let's start with, uh, we're gonna wrap up the video with this. We're gonna start by evaluating g of negative four. So that's gonna be equal to two, the integral from two to negative four of f of t dt, which is equal to negative the integral, negative 4 to 2, f of t dt. Because remember, if we switch the limits of integration, the, uh, the sign of the integral changes. So we want the value of 
the area under the curve from negative 4 to 2. So from negative 4 to 2, we want this area right here, negative 4 to 2. Okay, that area in pink um, is going to be negative 1 half. Well, these will cancel, and so we're left with negative 1 half. 2 is the base, 4 is the height. So we get negative 1 half, 2 times 4, so that's negative 4. And so that's the value of the function at our first endpoint, negative 4. Let's do the second endpoint, g of 2. So now we want the integral from 2 to negative 2. Similar with the last question, we're going to switch the limits of integration, which makes the value of the integral negative. Okay, and so now let's determine what the area under the curve is from negative 2 to 2. Well, in this case, that's just going to be this area right here. Okay, the area of that triangle. So it's going to be a base of 4, a height of 4. Divide that by 2 because we're finding the area of the triangle. So it's 1 half, 4 times 4. Uh, and that's going to be the number 8. Okay, two more. So this is 8. G of 6. This is the integral from 2 to 6 of f of t dt. Okay, this one's going to be a little bit easier because we don't have to change the limits of integration here. Remember, we always integrate from left to right. So the integral from 2 to 6 is the value of this. Sorry, this should be a, uh, this should be a negative right here. This is negative 8. Negative 8. Okay, the value of the function at 6 is going to be this area. We'll do it a different color. This area right here. And so this is going to be positive 8 because it's 1 half a base of 4 and a height of 4. So this is 1 half 4 times 4, which is 8, positive 8. Okay, and let's wrap this up by going through the value of the function at 12. Well, this is going to be the integral from 2 to 12 of f of t dt. Now, to find the value of the integral from 2 to 12, it's going to be this area plus this area plus this area right here. Well, notice that this region right here and this region right here they are equal in magnitude but opposite signs, so they're going to cancel out. And so the area we're looking for is just the value of this triangle here. It's going to be negative because it's below the x-axis. So it's going to be 1 half the base, which is 2, and the height is 4. So negative 1 half 2, the base, times the height, which is 4. So it's negative 4. Okay? And so this is negative 4 here. All right, so the absolute maximum is going to be the coordinate point that gives us the highest y value. Well, that's going to be here at 6, 8. And the absolute minimum is going to be the co coordinate point that gives you the lowest y value, and that would be here at negative 2. Okay, so remember, when you're finding the absolute maximum or absolute minimum, you have to check the endpoints that is denoted by these values here. And then you have to check the relative extrema. This right here is the relative uh, minimum and absolute minimum in this case because it, the value of g prime goes from negative to positive. And this is the relative maximum and the absolute maximum because the value of g prime goes from positive to negative. Okay, uh, if you're finished with this video, let's move on to the additional practice for the remainder of class. So work through this question, which is similar to uh, problem set number three.